Psalm 51, 1 through 12. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. with your ability to sing those Spanish words. You did a great job with that. We'll probably sing that, uh, this song again before too long. Spanish words as well as the uh, English words. Will you pray with me? Let your spirit move among us, O God, tearing down any obstacle that would keep us from hearing the healing, helping word that you have for us. In the name of Christ, amen. I wonder if you've ever noticed how um, easily some words seem to just disappear from our vocabulary and uh, fall out of common usage. Take the word redemption, for example. When was the last time you heard anybody but an out-of-touch preacher um, use that word redemption? That word fell out of use when the last of the S&H Green Stamp Redemption Centers <laughs> closed and nobody has used it to, since. Or take the word sin. There is uh, another word that has uh, fallen out of uh, common usage. You just don't hear that word sin very much anymore. You don't hear it in church and you don't hear it anywhere else either. There are, of course, some reasons for that. One of the words, one of the reasons that the word sin has fallen out of favor is because there was a time when it seemed as if the word sin was the only word the church knew. There was a time when preachers of a bygone age used to believe that it was their responsibility to send everybody home from church every week feeling like a miserable worm of a sinner. The problem with that is when you treat people as if they were a miserable worm of a sinner, it's quite likely that they will act as if they were a miserable worm of a sinner. And so it has seemed somewhat counterproductive to uh, use that uh, word in that way. There is, of course, another reason that the word sin has fallen out of uh, use. 
because there is such a close connection between the word sin and the word judgmentalism. All too often when we do talk about sin, our discussions of sin deteriorate into condemning somebody else's shortcomings and forgetting about our own shortcomings. Well, even though it's the case that uh, sin is uh, not the most popular word in the world anymore, it is also the case that in spite of all of the problems that come from the use of the word sin, Christians need to be aware of the reality of sin and the reality of the power of evil. You can't just pretend that it doesn't exist and hope that it will go away. And I suppose that is why of all the uh, psalms in that large book of psalms, this is the psalm, the one that was read for us this morning is the psalm that provides for us one of the best instruments we have for thinking a bit about sin and the problem of uh, and the problem of evil. This is a good psalm to help us think about that because it is a psalm in which the writer does not concentrate on somebody else's sin, but instead, instead acknowledges the problem that he is having with sin himself. Biblical uh, students are pretty much certain that this is one of the psalms that was written by King David. And they are pretty much uh, of the same mind that the uh, thing that David is struggling with in this psalm is uh, his uh, tryst with uh, Bathsheba and the consequences of that relationship that affected David's own life and that affected as well the nation of uh, Israel. So the psalmist begins by defining that word sin. The psalmist this morning in our text began by defining sin as a pain in humanity's heart. A pain in humanity's heart. This is what David means when he says in that psalm, I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. That uh, phrase, my sin is ever before me, is the one that interests me this morning because it is David's way of saying that there is no peace in his life because of his sin. There is no peace in his life. It, even in the gentler moments of his existence, there is never a time, he says, in his life when there is not a tumult roaring underneath the surface of his life. There is never a time, he says, there's never a time when he feels completely content and at peace. Does that sound familiar to you? It probably ought to sound familiar because it's the story of your life and the story of mine. The sin in our life keeps us from ever being completely peaceful and uh, and contented. I suppose that the uh, a Peanuts cartoon gang can help us to understand how that uh, works better than almost anybody else. One day Louis, Linus Lucy had been playing all day and they came back from the um, they came back from playing outside and they come through the doorway and Lucy hollers to her mother, we're home, Mom. 
We had a great time playing outside today. We had lots of fun playing outside today. But Linus is not quite so sure. He says, did I have a good time playing outside today, Lucy? And with her usual, usual, usual cynical uh, attitude, she looks at him with a frown and said, of course you had a good time. <laughs> oh, good, he said, because I'm never quite sure. <laughs> and that's the problem, isn't it? We are never really quite sure. Somehow, we're never quite sure that we're getting everything out of life that we ought to get. Somehow, it constantly seems to us that there ought to be more to life than we are experiencing. And we have this tremendous desire, this tremendous driving need to discover what it is that we're missing out on life and then to lay hold of it for our own, uh, for our own life. We just never are quite content with the way life is unfolding for us. And that tremendous desire that we have to lay hold of whatever it is that we're missing for our own life. That tremendous desire drives us to do all kinds of things that we know are not right for us to do. All kinds of things that we know are not healthy for us to do. That tremendous desire drives us to do all kinds of things that hurt the people around us. That tremendous desire to lay hold of whatever it is we're missing out on in life causes us, uh, causes us to do all kinds of things that uh, damage the creation. Sin, then, is that restlessness that constantly causes us to be dissatisfied. Sin is that constant restlessness that promises us heaven, but delivers hell. That promises us light, but delivers darkness. That prom promises us paradise, but delivers pain. Sin is a pain in humanity's heart. But that is not the end of the psalmist's understanding of sin. The psalmist understands that sin is not only a pain in humanity's heart. Sin is a pain in the heart of God as well. We've already said that biblical students believe that this is King David speaking. And that it, thing he, that is troubling him is the aftermath of his relationship with uh, Bathsheba. David understands that there have been consequences in his life because he has done what he knows is wrong. There have been consequences not only in his life, there have been consequences in the life of Bathsheba and in her family. There have as well been consequences in the life of the nation of Israel. David is aware of all of those consequences. But the thing that breaks David's heart is that he knows he has broken the heart of God. This is what he means when he says, against you and you only have I sinned. David knows that his sin has caused a pain in the heart of God. Because he remembers how God once said of him, David, you are a man after my own heart. 
And now he knows that he has betrayed the trust God has placed in him and that he has... that we can see that best if we pay attention to the writings of the biblical prophets. Here, for example, is the prophet Hosea speaking on behalf of God as God views the sin of the children of Israel. And with tears running down his cheeks, he said, when Israel was a child, I called him Adam. Egypt. But the more I called, the more he turned from me. Or here is the prophet Jeremiah speaking of the pain that God feels about the sin of Israel and Israel's reluctance to hear the voice of God. And Jeremiah pictures God as saying, if you, if you will not listen to me, I will cry tears in secret because of your pride. Bitter tears, bitter tears will run from my eyes. And here is Jesus Christ himself, the very incarnation of God, He's headed for, the, for Jerusalem for the, what will be the last week of his life there. As he makes his way down the road leading from Bethany to Jerusalem, he comes to a viewpoint. He can see the city of Jerusalem spread out there in front of him. He stops and watches for a while and thinks of what is going to happen there in the city of Jerusalem within the next week. And with tears in his eyes, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you under my wing as a hen gathers her chicks? But you, you would not. Our sin is a pain in the heart of God. Comes then the question, what are we to do about our sin? Is there anything we can do about it? Is there anything we can do about that awful pain? Is there any way, any way at all, that things can be different? And David, in the psalm that we have read this morning, says there is a way that things can be different. That's the good news that is proclaimed to us in this psalm. Things can be different. Our sin does not have to defeat us. David says there is only one thing to do with our sin, and that is to give it to God. Because God is the only one, God is the only one who can handle all that pain. God is the only one who can handle that sin because is that who Hosea what the God of Hosea said when he uh, looked upon the sin of Israel and said to them, how can I let you go? How can I give you up? How can I abandon you? Now David knows, David knows that God would be perfectly in his right to say, I'm not going to have anything at all to do with you anymore. I've had it with you. I'm finished with you. Don't come crying to me anymore. But David says, no. 
No. God is not like that. God is like the God Hosea knew. How can I give you up? How can I abandon you? How can I let you go? The thing of it is, David understands that uh, if we will give our sin to God, God is willing to take it. And what will God do with it? Toss it away, wash us clean, and give us a second chance. For God behaves in the same way that Hosea behaved when his wife betrayed him over and over again. You remember that story? He provided for her and she over and over again went back to a different kind of life. And what did Hosea do? Over and over again he went out and lifted her out of the gutter and carried her home and washed her off and said to her, I will not, I will not punish you in my anger. That, David says, is exactly the way in which God treats us. Lifting us time and time again out of the gutter where we've fallen. Carrying us back home. Washing us clean giving us a second chance at life. And so here is the threefold formula that the, that the uh, psalmist offers us for dealing with our sin. Three steps that we can take to deal with our sin. First of all, name it. That is, confess your sin to Almighty God. Second of all, claim it. That is to say, don't try to blame it on somebody else. Don't try to blame it on the circumstances of your life. Don't try to blame it on God. Just claim it as your own. Name it and claim it. And then the third step is, release it. Give it to God who wants to take it and throw it away and give us, give us a second chance at life. Name it, claim it, release it. And in that process, you, like the psalmist, will come to know the joy the joy of God's salvation. Let us pray. We thank you, gracious God, that you've delivered us from the power of sin and death and have brought us into the realm of your Son. And we pray that as by his death he called us to life, so by his love he may forgive us and raise us to the joys of life eternal. Amen.